Hello, welcome. Thank you. That was quite the chatter. It's very exciting. My name is Christina McLeod, and I'm the Chief Taskmaster and Partner at Volume 18, a strategic communications firm based in Stratford, PI. I'm honored to be here this evening as your MC for this event. If you had told me about 20 years ago when I was coming out of my undergrad there would be an environmental meeting with beer, music, and a full packed house, I would have thought you were crazy. So this is very heartwarming to see such a great turnout. A few logistical things for this evening because we do have a live stream happening. If you do have a cell phone, if you could put it on vibrate, uh, that would be lovely. Um, also the washrooms, if you go out of the theater, they're to the right as well. And I'd like to acknowledge that we meet here tonight in Mi'kma'ki, the homeland of the Mi'kmaq people. We recognize that the land on which we gather is the ancestral territory of the Mi'kmaq First Nation. A few uh, dignitaries to, to, to recognize this evening. We have the Minister of Environment, Energy, and Climate Action, Stephen Myers. We have the leader of the Green Party of PI, Peter Bevan Baker, and MLA, Oli Hamiland. Um, so thank you very much for uh, joining this evening. I'd now like to call upon uh, the Minister, Stephen Myers, to uh, say a few words of welcome for everyone. Well, thank you, Christina. Uh, I have to say I'm, I'm really impressed, not only with, with uh, my staff and the people who pulled this together, but for all of you for coming out here tonight. I, I was saying in the lobby earlier <clears throat> when it was fir first brought to my attention we were going to use this venue, I said, do you think that might be a little big for the turnout we'll get? And here we are sold out, so well done. Um, <clears throat> this is an exciting night. Obviously, uh, we have some very distinguished guests that are going to do some speaking here tonight, and I think uh, uh, I'll probably talk more into my relationship with Zorin when I'm up on the stage here with him later on. But in 2019, after the election, I ended up with the energy portfolio uh, that was in transportation at the time. <clears throat> and if you recall, our legislature sat late that year, and the energy minister's meeting was kind of jammed up right with the end of the legislature, but I managed to make it, so, th so the first one that I ever went to was in Cranbrook, BC. And because I was so late booking it, I took the absolute milk run to uh, Cranbrook, which was like 26 hours. I was, <laughs> it was terrible, but I was really excited to be there. So I got there and it was uh, um, really interesting to see some of the things that were going on. The majority of the conversations dealt with potash and oil and mines and those types of things, and I thought, you know, it's really not a place for us to have a conversation for people who have the concerns that PEI does. Like, how do we transition? How do we, we get uh, energy production that's clean? How do we grow that in Prince Edward Island? But one of the things that I left with when I was sitting on the tarmac waiting for my plane to take off, looking ahead to another, another 26 hours of flying across the country, I thought, what can I take home from this? Because I really feel I have a responsibility to come back to Prince Edward Island with something that's going to matter to the, to the people. And what I saw was, uh, when I was in Cranbrook, a tour of the community, it was a First Nations community, who had bought the residential school, or was given the residential school that their, uh, their community was uh, placed in during that period of time, and turned it into a resort and a golf course. And around it they built uh, central heating, and they had all sorts of energy implements that they were using to run their own community so they could save money and invest their money back into their own community. And I thought, that's it. That's something that we can do on Prince Edward Island. So we, we went to SAMSO in the fall of that year. We'll talk about it later. It was a life-changing experience for me because I met Zorin, who is very, very bright and uh, has done some wonderful things in, in uh, his jurisdiction. <clears throat> And we started looking forward on how we could do some of these things. So we started the, our pathway to net zero so we could have a definitive path for Prince Edward Island to, to decarbonize so that we can do the things that we need to do on the community level once we had a plan that was going to work for us. And because of that, we, we were able to kick off some projects to get people excited about what we were doing, our, our EV rebate, our solar rebate, um, the electric school buses, I know Christopher from Lion Bus is here with us tonight um, 
those things were, were really exciting for us to start showing Islanders that we're going to make the transition by biting off these big chunks, but there's a lot of work to do on the small side of it yet. Our, uh, our heat pump program has been really popular, and today we moved the threshold up to $75,000. So we anticipate with this move that we'll have half of the houses on Prince Edward Island will qualify for a free heat pump, which for us does two things. It helps with energy poverty in homes, but it certainly helps us decarbonize uh, homes that are, would be traditionally relying on fossil fuels to heat. So, uh, And Derek Ellis, the director of our sustainability division, <laughs> he tells me that every time we install a heat pump, we displace 1,000 liters of furnace oil out of a home a year. So that's pretty impressive, I think. Um, <clears throat> we've done a number of, of initiatives that we're excited about. We have our Clean Tech Academy that we're working with Holland College and UPEI, which we're really excited. It's going to bring uh, a, a flavor of research and activity into our approach, and that also is something that came from the discussions we had when we were in SAM. So, um, <clears throat> I just want to leave you with, with this. I think that far too often I've heard political leaders in Prince Edward Island say that we punch above our weight on something, or on, we take a file and we punch above our weight. And uh, I, it couldn't be further from the truth. And when it comes to this transition and what we're doing, not only with our decarbonization, but our energy transition, we are setting the class. We're not punching above our weight. This is the class. And, and we're chasing Samso, who's smaller than us. So there's nothing wrong with being small. We don't have to say we're punching above our weight. We are setting the bar for everybody else to follow in Canada and other jurisdictions in the world. <clears throat> And I just want to touch on a couple things that, that prove that. I know the minister from Newfoundland was over to meet with me last year to talk about our free heat pump program and how Newfoundland wants to implement it. Nova Scotia's looking to implement it. New Brunswick's looking to implement it. Our staff is, is doing our best to try to help them, show them what we've, we've done to reduce barriers to make that happen. In 2020, um, Catherine McKenna, who was the minister of infrastructure at the time and a good friend of mine, on, a, on an infrastructure call, I talked about our active transportation fund and how we were building bike paths acro across Prince Edward Island so that we could decarbonize by getting people to drive bicycles. She got really excited. She asked, can you tell me more? And I said, my staff can. So my staff met with her staff. And not that long after that, she introduced a program nationwide to help build bike paths in Prince Edward Island. So the work that we do here is being watched by other jurisdictions. And the work that we do here shows that we can be leaders because people are asking us to tell them how that we did it so they could do the same thing. So I look forward to hearing what Zoran has tonight, and I'm sure that everyone will be excited. So I want to thank you all for coming. This is an exciting night for us. Thanks. Thank you, Minister. I now have the pleasure of introducing our keynote speaker, Zorn Hemerson is the CEO and director of Samso Energy Academy, which opened in 2007. He's been the driving force behind the transformation of Samso into a world-famous renewable energy island. Since 2007, the island has been self-sufficient and carbon neutral. Zorn won the Gotbag Award in 2009 as the first Danish person ever for his work on sustainable energy on Samso. This award is also known as the environmental version of the Nobel Prize. In 2022, just recently, SAMHSA was awarded the UN Global Climate Action Award for its climate leadership and dedicated communal efforts. Soren's knowledge and experience on how to successfully lead local energy system transformation and environmental change are especially valuable to Prince Edward Island, as we are an island, but also undergoing this as well and as we strive to achieve our net zero 2040 goals and become a national leader, as the minister had just talked about, in climate change action. Please join me in welcoming Soren Hemerson to the stage. Thank you. It's hot. I cannot see you. I mean, we used to say hello to everybody. When we get into a room, we kind of walk around. People stand around in, 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 at the corner of the walls here, and we go from person to person and say hello. Here I am. 
We couldn't do that, but, but we usually do that because we recognize who we are and who is here and who is kind of in the meeting. So, so we kind of commit to that, yes, I'm here and I have a purpose being here because it means something. And it means a lot to me to be here. Uh, I've been here once before um, on PEI and, and I was looking so much uh, forward to come back and, and see where you're at and what you're doing here because I think we are rela related in many different ways. I think my ancestor Vikings, they rode all the way out here. <laughs> and they ended up on PEI because it was the land of, of, of milk and honey and, and, and grapes, the, the wine land. I think it was here, somebody told me. I can see some blue-eyed guys with the... <laughs> so, I'm going, I don't have so much time, so I'm going straight on to the, to the, to the presentation. I'm from Samsø. I'm born and raised on Samsø. I, I tried to leave, but I couldn't. I came back. Uh, I'm from a farming family, so I've been, I'm, I'm educated. I can drive a combine and a tractor and stuff like that, so that's good. I can reverse a trailer I mean, all around the house, which is a qualification to talk to farmers and other guys. Otherwise, you're kind of a useless person from a city. I mean, that, that. <clears throat> so, so I'm here to talk about what we did here. So catching energy island spirit is a multiple choice thing also, because there's so many reasons to do what we have done. I mean, how, how do you choose to be an energy island, a sustainable island, and all these sort of things? I think that's because that's embedded in our inherited kind of culture and history. We have to be able to deal with our own consumption and production. This kind of circular economy was invented by islanders because otherwise we wouldn't survive. So, so it's, it's still in the making that we need to be able to, to navigate in that uh, dimension. So we pledged in 1997, we won a competition to be the Danish energy island. And, and nobody knew about that. So, so I was the first person to be hired to kind of fulfill this ambition, which was created by the minister who went to Kyoto. So that was COP3 in 1996 in Kyoto, in Japan, where he promised, I'll go home and make a sustainable community and showcase that Denmark can do this. We won the competition and nobody on the island knew about it. <laughs> so, so, so that was the beginning of a process where we actually kind of realized that, hey, this is crazy. And, and in the beginning, people kind of responded to like, like we crossed arms and kind of a very resistant, I mean, very stubborn, no, this is not going to work. This is something from Copenhagen. I mean, I don't know how you feel about things from the capital. <laughs> we don't feel good about it. It's usually somebody who wants to sell us something and we don't really need. So we pledged to give up fossil fuels. So we had the oil crisis in the 70s, and from that on, I mean, the Danish government decided to decommission coal and oil for energy production in Denmark because it was, it was too much depending on international market prices. And that kind of influenced a lot the economy of Denmark. So we decided to look at it as, as part of the Danish kind of thinking, the commodity, the community engaged in administrating the common the common economy, the commons in the old days was access to grassland, to firewood, to fishing rights, to water, and all these sort of things. That was a kind of vital component in, in, in organizing a community. So the only reason for people to be in a community is what, because they needed access to the commons. Otherwise, I mean, it's a nuisance. Neighbors are like a, it's not easy. I mean, they're, they, <laughs> <laughs> you had to get along with a lot of different people, but if there's a purpose of doing it, then you kind of pull yourselves together and do your best to make it, make it work here also. So the commodities is, I mean, you might think that this Danish guy, he cannot spell the beautiful English language, which is partly true, but, it, but it's, it's, a, it's, it's, a com it's a word we created out of commons plus community must be commodity. This is the local community administrating the commons, which is in the modern version is wind, solar, biomass, and all the things that goes into this equation. Human beings in, in, exist in language, conversation, stories, and narratives. I kind of like the introduction where you honor the, the, the ancestors and, and, and the First Nations and things here also. There's a history behind everything, and we are resting on, our, resting on the shoulders of the past, which I think is very important to remember that we're actually doing things that somebody prepared us to be able to do. Otherwise, we couldn't do it. Every time I hear people thinking about something new and they're very excited about it, I think, do you remember that this came from a long line of development and evolution that was created by people who really struggled and fought for this to happen? So, so evolution is, is, is stories and narratives about being able to. So sustainability is also like a funny word. 
Sustainability, to sustain, for me it's to sustain and to be able to. So the ability to do it is more interesting than to sustainability in general. I, maybe that was a little, little bit too philosophical, I don't know. Do you mind? All right, okay. I'm not a philosopher, but I, but I like kind of things, breaking up words. Human being invents their worlds with words, conversation, and actions. So the narrative of change is something that comes out of a, of a, of a commun communication, a conversation about the future, where we want to go further than we have done. Nobody had tracked this past before, so we have to do it together. So the narrative of change is something we do together in a conversation about the future and where we want to go with it. Organizations are networks of conversations, of commitments, of taking action and producing results. So the story that you just kind of were introduced by Stephen Myers, the minister, is, is kind of, the, it, it is the pathway to kind of a future where we are trying to talk ourselves into this platform where the future will take place. And I think that is an interesting kind of uh, parallel to what we're doing here. So in 10 years, or less than 10 years, we became totally independent from fossil fuels from outside. We produce much more energy than we are consuming. We, we still need energy for ferries and trucks, but, but, but we are producing much more energy, so we compensate for the CO2 emission from heavy transportation. We have offshore, onshore uh, windmills, we have district heating, we have solar, we have many different things here. So I don't want to get into details. You can search that on the internet. There's a lot of information about it. So I think in, technology is not so interesting. What do you think? I think people are more interesting how we get people on board this also. Technology is tools to, to change what we, what, what we want to get changed. SAMSA is a beautiful place, as you can see. It's, I mean, it's the most beautiful place on Earth. Here it's just misty and gray and wet and... <laughs> And in this beautiful country, uh, this nature, you want to put wind turbines. I know this is controversial. It's controversial all over the world, wind power. Wind power is kind of the key to many things here also. And we kind of develop a wind industry in Denmark. And when we started thinking about having wind turbines, you can see that we have wind turbines in the landscape. This is very early morning on the way to my job, to the Energy Academy. You can see there's three one megawatt wind turbines here. And you see in the distance, there's a smokestack. This is a nearby power station that used to feed Samsø, and this is just one out of three power stations. We are surrounded by centralized power stations. In the past, they used coal, now they use gas. So we have actually acidic rain coming to Samsø because of this. So the argument for wind turbines is that they are, they are acting as ventilators to, to ventilate the smoke away from Samsø. <laughs> Actively, kind of, maybe it's not really true, but you, under, you get it. You're, you're fast thinkers here. I, I can see that. I, I understand. An experiment doesn't have to be perfect. An experiment can open the way for something radically new. Sometimes you're met with crossed arms where people say, uh, it's probably, I heard about it, but it, it's not going to work here. That's not what we used to do. You, you're not that conservative here, right? You have much more open minds to change. I'm sure about that. But in some cities, we are a farming community, and farmers are a little bit protective about what they know. So they know what they know and what is in the, in the future they don't know. So they have to kind of adapt to this and get used to the thinking. So therefore, we need experiments so we can actually open the door to, into something new, a change kind of thinking. And I think that is very important that you actually allow change to happen. Not to be sure that it will function 100% perfect from day one, but you have to be able to make the change that can, can do this. I think farmers have done that all the time. Common ground, different reasons, is also to call different people to the table to negotiate and talk about change here also. You have a common ground with this PEI. This is the, the, the quest to, to get carbon neutral, to get into this equation, but you have many different reasons to be here. Some are like old hippies. I don't know. I can't see that. Who still wants, I mean, they still haven't forgotten to save. They want to save the world and the climate and everything. They want to save more, more or less everything. And, and then we have the business guys who would just want to ex exploit the world badly. Do we have any in the room? <laughs> but that was kind of the, the, the most extreme of both versions. You, then you have everything in the middle is, is people. This is us. That we have both the uh, kind of the idealistic part of it and we have the, the pragmatic. We also make a living and we want to make some money out of it. So, so this is kind of common ground, the different reasons. And these two things have to meet somewhere in the middle. This is what we call the common. This is the economy of change. 
So this is my island from north to south, seen from Google. You can travel in Google and see Samsø. It's, it's not a big island, 30 kilometers long. We have 4,000 people. But we have like, I don't know if there's a pointer here. Is there? Oh, there is a pointer. This is the north end of the island. We have like, this is a nature reserve, like a lagoon with a lot of migrating. We have Canadian geese there, like thousands of them. They, they eat all our, our crops. So I don't know why you don't keep them home and you should shut the fence. I mean, get a grip on these guys. They are very hungry geese. <laughs> but they breed here like many other geese and many, many other species. So this is a protected breeding area for birds. So nobody lives here. This is a nature area. In the old days, there was no real connection from here to here. So the North Island has their own di dialect. It's a different kind of people. I mean, I mean they, 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 they used to marry sisters and brothers, so there's a lot of inbred families in that area. That's also why you can see when, you, when you're there, you can see they're a little bit crooked and bent. And <laughs> the more smart and educated people live here on the south end of the island. <laughs> Did I tell you my house is down here on the south end of the island? <laughs> All right. But these are, so this is not one community. It's many communities within the community. I think PEI is exactly the same. You have many different, I mean, not tribal, but, but, but almost. <laughs> so this is Denmark. Sweden is over here, and here you have Germany, and this is Denmark. This is the peninsula where the Vikings, they roamed from, and they have Fyn, where Hans Christian Andersen was, and this is Copenhagen, where the queen has his castle over here in the capital. And if you make a perfect circle around Denmark, Samsø is right in the center. We are the center of Denmark. You can see that clearly. Copenhagen, they don't know that, but we know for sure that they're... So this is the European Union, and the European Union thinks that Brussels is the center, but you can see that's off the main. Samsø is the center of Europe. <laughs> <clears throat> I don't... I, you probably had some idea that PEI was the center of the world. I, try, I proved you wrong, <laughs> clearly. But my point is that you are in the center of your next move, of your, of your development, of your life. And I think that is very important to remember. It's not happening out there or at the UN or anywhere else. It's, it's right here. We, ha we are in the center of every exercise we have to do to, to make a better world and to do things here. Like we can, We're connected, yes, but we, we still have the respons responsibility is here. Power without love is cost and ruthless. Love without power is sentimental. I mean, we have a Greta Thunberg ex exercise now where people are activists. Young people are activists. They're telling kind of all the wrong things we're doing here. And I think that is perfectly right. They should do that. We should point out things we have to change also. But we also need some change makers who can actually activate all the ideas on all the good examples of how we're going to do it. We can't live with only one side of that also. So we have to bring these two sides together around the table to make decisions and finance the change here. Because it takes money and planning and stuff like that. So power and love have to sit next to each other around the table to make change. So these are change makers. These are a bunch of hippies and farmers and everybody from Samsung, and they went to the factory to buy to purchase 10 offshore wind turbines. That was the biggest business we ever made. I hardly slept for two years because I was a project secretary. And I know if we failed that project and failed people's money, I wouldn't have been here. I mean, I wouldn't have lived on Samsung anymore. I'd probably have been a refugee in Africa somewhere. <clears throat> because this was private money, private people's money that was invested in these guys. And, and, and the whole thing was kind of one of the, the legs in the energy transition. This is my old math teacher. I didn't like him so much when I was in school, but he didn't like me either. But he, he invested his pension money in, in, in wind and solar, and he was so happy about it, and he smiled, it's better to have my money on the roof than in the bank. And I think the future proved him right. And, and to do this, we kind of did a lot of different things, offshore, onshore. The offshore was interesting also because there was a lot of resistance on the offshore. We now, today, have discovered we have like a new reef because we, the seabed is suffering also from too much fishing and, and other things here also. So this is a fishing prohibited area, 100 meters on both sides. It's 20 meters deep and it's eight kilometers long, this row here. It doesn't look like, but there's like 400 meters between every turbine. So from the shore to the end of it, that's eight kilometers of, of wind, wind turbines. And this is a reef, and we, if we dive down there, there's scallops and mussels and lobsters and fish in, in, in big masses, because now it's a new breeding area, because this is a fishing prohibited area. We need to protect the fish, and the wind turbines can do that. 
That's an unforeseen side effect of the, of the turbines, which I really like. And I kind of, I knew that from the beginning because I like the sea. So I made a little note in the planning saying that I own the right to, to harvest mussels on the foundations of the wind turbines. <laughs> so I take people out there and I scrape mussels off and make mussel soup and mussel everything. That's really good. The, the, the surplus from the wind turbines is invested in, in canopies with solar, electric vehicles for the municipalities. So all public cars on Samsung now is electric, and we charge them with our own facilities. Um, and, and this has been kind of a driving force for the introduction of second-hand uh, electric cars. Because, I mean, a lot of people on Samsung, they, they don't drive new cars because, I mean... It's a rugged, dirt road area where, where you need, don't want to have a new, expensive car. So when these guys are out of their lease contract, they, the people can buy them cheap, and they're still good. They don't run, run so many miles here also. And we have a mechanic who can fix them now because we have a critical mass of electric vehicles on the island, so we can service them also and make them run at all times here. So that was kind of a, kind of a groundbreaking period before we had enough cars so we could get them serviced. They had to get off the island to get service elsewhere, and that made people... Ch kind of be doubtful about choosing an electric car. Now they don't. So we have the highest amount of electric cars in any municipality per capita in Denmark. We also have a ferry problem, like you have. <clears throat> so we, the first ferry we changed was one to go into the west. It should have been a biogas ferry, but it's a gas hybrid ferry sailing on electricity produced from gas. So, so it, it, all the thrusters are electric. And this is really good. I mean, in the beginning we thought about it and we said, we are, we're going to use gas for this ferry. So when I did talks to the local community, and they asked me, how are we going to produce this gas? So we needed it at the Idesta. But on top of that, we also said there'll be a special system on the ferry. So, so they'll call all the housewives on Samsung to have these special uh, cabbage recipes and serve them in the cantina on the ferry. And then we have a strong headwind. The, the captain will say, ah, this is the captain. We have a serious headwind. So in <laughs> we need all the passengers on the left-hand side to go to the toilet now <laughs> so we can get some power on the ferry. <clears throat> so this is kind of making relevance that we don't waste bio, biomass. We don't waste bioenergy because this is a resource we have. And we have plenty of it. So why not use it in an energy mix here to, together with solar and, and, and wind? The next ferry you're going to have now is, is a bigger one. It's 180 cars, and it's about six, 700 passengers. I'm not sure about it, but that's, be, that's going to be fully electric. And the driving range is about one hour and 15 minutes uh, to the mainland. And it's going to use about three to four uh, megawatt hours to just to charge it. And we have to charge that in 20 minutes when it's port time. So, I mean, that will probably dim the light on the whole island. When they put that switch on, that's a hell of a switch. <laughs> I have to admit that. But on the other hand, it's also we have enough power to, to feed it, but maybe not uh, instantly. So we're looking at having a booster battery that can actually load the, the, the charge the battery during the daytime, and then when the ferry is in, we have the whole capacity in the battery. So this is calling for new technology and, and administration and balance and stuff like that, which I also think is relevant for, for you to study here. Uh, this is kind of in the future. A strong, sustainable, and robust community must share locality, activity, and mentality. We have a lot of direct ownership in this also. People have invested loads of money in the energy transition. But we also have a lot of people who just kind of say this is a good thing for Samsu because it has provided a lot of jobs, a lot of innovation, a lot of newcomers to the island that moved to Samsu because we had an aging population 20 years ago, and we missed the young people because they moved away from the island to go to university in the mainland in Copenhagen and Aarhus and other places. So that whole mid-generation from 20 to 30 years was missing totally. And we missed kids in the school and stuff like that. So that was a, a kind of a, uh, what do you call it, a crisis, you could say. So the energy transition created the possibilities for people to come and settle and work there and have kids and kind of feed the school with, 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 with more, more kids uh, because otherwise it, it would close. Last year, was the, we had a baby boom, so that was the highest number of newborn babies that was born like the last 20 years. So we're on the right path now. I mean, we, I don't know if it's in the water or how they did it, but, but we believe in the future now. I mean, that's, that's when babies are born, and that's when people start believing there's a future for me here. We can maintain a job and have a life here. Otherwise, they wouldn't do it. So mentality, the mental feeling of ownership is really important, that people feel they are onboarded, they are connected, they are part of the process, even if they don't have kind of a, a direct stake in, in what's happening here. We need to create kind of fire, fire places, like the, 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 what do you call it, the, 
image of fire is that you, you gather around a good idea and then you exchange how do, we, how, do, how do we obtain this? How do we actually maintain the fire? I mean, maybe firewood is not a good metaphor anymore, but, but, but it was once. And I think people have good memories around the fire. There's a barbecue, there's some beer, there's a guitar, and somebody is playing, and you feel good. And people can exchange ideas about the future. And this is where we want to meet in a comfortable, safe zone of, of evolution, where we actually think we are home, we are here, and we can do things if we actually put our act together and, and start doing it. So, so the reason why we do this, we keep on having visions for SAMHSA. So the next one is 2030 SAMHSA Fossil Independent Island. So we are looking at, at, at consumption as well. Consumption, import, export, which is one of the bigger issues also. It's easy to produce yourself out of the, of the problem. But if you're also going to administrate all the consumption and loads here, also, it's going to be much more complicated. But we need to take that on as well also. So there we need to talk to farmers, production, consumption, import, export, which is again looking at people, people's habit and the living standard of people also. I mean, it's not easy to tell people that you should spend less, you should use less. All these sort of things is not really good because, I mean, we, we want to be free people who can do whatever we want. But I think it, that time is over. We need to administrate our, our footprint. Some of the used cars also, we have a tourist industry. So the, this car guy, he is now buying these second-hand cars and he leased them out. So in every harbor, we have five uh, little yacht harbors. There's a two or three electric cars you can rent. And in the wintertime, they are shared cars. Some people come in, do you have a shared car system on Samsung? Yeah, if you know somebody who has a car who he wants to share. <laughs> but isn't there an app or something like that where you can kind of download, you can be, that's a city thing. But on Samsung, you, you have to know somebody with a truck or with a car you can rent. If you have something to share with or to exchange, then you can always get a car or a tractor or a truck or anything like that. But this guy here kind of saw the potential of loading. I mean, he's charging green electricity from Samsung and people are getting an adventurous day when they're there, uh, leasing an, an electric car. So, so this is one thing that I can only advise you to have more like. The meeting format is so our positioning of the chairs determines the function of society. We have also learned that we cannot trust experts. I don't know if you have any experts in the room. There's probably a few. We need them, but we need to be able to ask the questions before we get the answers. So the way we position this also that to avoid having experts speaking to you as lecturers to tell you how the future looks, looks like, but we need to be able to sit down as a community and talk about how do we want to see our community develop in the future and then be able to ask questions and invite the, the experts to come and teach us what they know so we can administrate the future based on the technology development we, uh, and, and the future um, from our own point of view and not to be told by somebody else. We need to get together about that. This is a little bit constructed. We don't do that every day. <laughs> but it's kind of holding hands and being kind of we are the world for some time. I mean, we have to negotiate this every year and reconnect to the purpose of this. There's no such thing as a permanent commodity or community. We need to reconnect to this also and reconnect to the agreement that we are on the right track here and we're doing the right thing. We rest on the shoulders of three, four hundred years of, 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 of civilization uh, and more. Uh, these houses are, some of them are three, four hundred years old and people still live there. So we need to protect what we have inherited and we also need to prepare for the future. This is the Energy Academy. Solar panels on the roof and we have a meeting place. This is a great place for innovation. We have visitors from everywhere. This is also where Stephen Myers and, and his group came and visited the Energy Academy. Tr trying to build new meeting places. The circle is kind of a metaphor for a good meeting. So we try to do that also. So I, I can only advise you to have something similar, like a meeting house for the global uh, transformation. We are part of a European network with 300 committed islands that's connected to the European island network. And I hope that we in the future also can have a global network of islands that can help each other in this innovation and do this. So partly also my reason for being here, I think we are friends. We should work together and we should share what we know so we can, we can speed up the process and do things. We won this competition last year uh, to be the UN climate leader. So this is me and my mayor. Um, I had this COVID filter, uh, sorry about that. But <clears throat> And this is Guadalajara in Mexico, the city of Guadalajara, and this is Paris. Uh, so so Samsung, Guadalajara, and Paris, uh, that's a good company. <laughs> 
But, but anyway, SAMHSA has this kind of footprint in the world that we, are, we, we have done something remarkable. And I think you, you are able to do the same here. I think you have the, you have the conditions, you have the, the geography to be the center of, of evolution in Canada and be this example of, of, of how it's, it's going to be done. Thank you very much. Oh, this was not my slide. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> Thank you, Soren. And again, as he spoke about with words, you know, hearing his story and Samso's story is, is so meaningful and puts it into great context for everyone here in the room. So we really appreciate him being here in person and being able to share, um, you know, their success and their path uh, to being um, more uh, energy re renewable and, and net zero. So now I have the privilege of introducing our fireside chat participants. So we're going to have a nice little fireside. It's not, you know, the campfire, but I don't know if someone has a guitar as well. I will not sing or play, I promise. Um, so we're going to invite back on the stage the Minister of Environment, Energy, and Climate Action, Stephen Myers, um, as well as um, Soren. And then we're also joined by Dr. Ant Anna DeMeo, DeMeo? Oh, I had it earlier, works at the intersection of climate change and, and um, emerging technology with community engagement and viable economic models across the energy industry. We're very lucky to have Anna on Prince Edward Island, and she is also the chief product officer for Fermata Energy, the leader of vehicle to everything charging systems. Anna also previously served as the co-founder and president of RacePoint Energy, a flexible load management and microgrid technology company. RacePoint Energy was acquired by Savant Systems, Inc., which is the parent company of GE Lighting and Savant P Power, where she served as Savant's uh, chief technology officer. Anna also holds a number of patents and has been an author, author of numerous articles on climate change, renewable energy, and smart grid utilization. She's a great one to also Google when you're home if you haven't had the chance to as yet. Um, and currently, she serves as the Associate Professor of Sustainable Design and Engineering at the University of Prince Edward Island. So I welcome everyone here um, to come up to have a fireside chat. Great. Well, thank you. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, oh, now we can see people a little bit better. Uh, so we had a great day today. We had uh, about 55 people over at the Delta um, from all, all across the island uh, talking about energy, talking about community, uh, talking about issues that are important to the island, um, which was just phenomenal. Uh, I've only been here on PEI for about five years, and I think, I think you knew more people today than I did, um, which was disheartening, so I have to get out there more, clearly. Um, no, but it was great. Actually, before we get going, I'd like to have two people stand up. Angela Banks and Jessica Brown. Are you here? Anywhere? Angela, like, can you stand right up? These two women have done a phenomenal job bringing us all together. I mean, talk about change makers. Um, they're getting it done. So, so after, after this, Angela said that we would be doing a fireside chat. And Soren and I, being diligent that we are, decided to practice. So we went over to the Great George and sat by the fire. Sorry, we didn't include you on that one. We were, right? <laughs> but we were reflecting on the, the community engagement today and um, uh, the conversations that I know you've 
you've heard again and again, you've done community energy all over the world, uh, Japan, Hawaii, up and down the coast of the US, and these themes that we hear uh, again and again from these communities really trying to figure out the next step. And, and Minister, you said that you came back um, inspired by SAMHSA, so many of us have, myself included, years ago, and, um, and it's that connection that really makes us think about how do we get from here to where we want to go. So I guess the first conversation I was going to um, have here is, is what did you bring back from SAMHSA? What inspired you and what, what lessons do you take from them? And then to Soren, you know, what lessons and, and reflections do you have on, on meeting the group today and what will you bring back from PEI? But did you start? Okay, well we took quite a bit away. I mean, Honestly, we were trying to wrap our head around what, how we were going to tackle some of the problems that we knew we had to tackle, and SAMSO had a really unique uh, approach to it, where it was community energy and the, the community was benefited from it, which is not something we had been doing up until that point. And, uh, you know, we, we probably weren't getting the buy-in that we needed, and we probably needed to change our model, which we've been working on quite diligently here the last couple of years. But the, the second was the, the Energy Academy itself was the, we, we are building a clean tech park in Georgetown now, but we called it the Energy Academy for a long time because that's, to us, that's what it was. It was, and it was the center, it appeared to be the center of where everything kind of happened in Sam. So it's where the experts were, it's where the ideas were coming out of. And I, I thought, you know, for us, we really need to have that center of expertise so that, so that ideas can come out of it that will help us. But bigger than that ideas that can come out of there that can help the rest of the world because I believe that the ideas that come out of SAMHSA are, are currently helping us with our decisions. So it set us on a path that we hadn't been on up until then and uh, it was proof that we could do it and we could do it in a, a manner that everyone could be a part of and it could benefit everyone. It didn't have to be a, a corporate model for, uh, for us to be able to do it. It could be very much a driven model that, would, that Islanders could all benefit from. So. Absolutely. I mean, I think we took away similar when we first came um, back from SAMHSA and realized that so much of this, and, and, you know, I am an engineer and so technology is super important, but, but as you were saying in your talk just now, that you have to know what questions to ask before we can find those solutions. So, Soren, do you have reflections on today and, and being here and what will you bring back? Well, I'm, I'm a big fan of local communities, so, so I really enjoy to, to kind of enter a community and start investigating kind of who are you guys and I and I think this is this is always like what is the construct of a society and how does it work this is a mystery to me every time how, how things are working I and mean, you seem to be working pretty good here I mean you, you, you're well off and the, the island is in the, in a good condition it looks like I, I, I can only see what my eyes tells me I don't have numbers and structures like that only what I'm I've been told here so driving around and looking at it is interesting to see that you're very similar to us. I mean, we have probably the best potatoes in the world. <laughs> and here I learned that you have the best potatoes. <laughs> Which I think kind of the connection is interesting because you, you have your own narrative of, 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 of what is possible here. And you have good soil, and apparently it's, it, it's a good place to produce kind of food and vegetables and especially potatoes. The same on Samsung. We have mild climate. We live in the middle of Kattegat, which is like uh, the internal seas here, and we almost hardly have any frost, which means that we are a milder climate than the rest of Denmark. So central Denmark, even if it's a small country, have frost like longer than we have. So we can get in the ground earlier than, than anybody else. So we, can, we have the first potatoes on the market, like the spring potatoes or the summer potatoes are the most delicious little gold nuggets you can imagine, because they were also very expensive. So I've, I have the same feeling here that you have this kind of this a sense of original kind of production quality and things here, which is a brand that we have to appreciate and take care of. I also see that you're also suffering from industrialization and modern kind of industry uh, development that is kind of compromising a little bit the, the cozy little romantic feeling about islands. And that's kind of modern times. We, we have the, exactly the same. We try to keep in the old paradigm, but we are entering the new and I can feel that we are on the same platform here. This is more or less the same paradigm you're, you're in the middle of. 
And how do we navigate in that? And I feel there's a lot of aligned thoughts and ideas and also anxiety and fears about change here amongst you that I can kind of totally recognize from my own, 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 uh, own community, which makes me think that we have so much in common that we should work together. I mean, in, 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 the globe, there's, in, the, in the global community, there's so many communities like us, and we have the chance, we are rich, we are well, well off, we have it organized, so I think also we have an obligation to do more than just keeping our own minds and, and own businesses here also, and via the university and the college and, and, and everybody who's working here, we should actually make kind of like examples, learning processes, and exchange with everybody what we, what we do here. Not what we think we can teach, other, but what we can exchange. I don't think we're smarter than everybody, but, but we, we are in the middle of the process. And I think that is the most valuable point to share. This is where we are considering things here, and we can have other minds onboarded and, 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 and start thinking with us. I think that is very important. That's a great point you bring up about uh, education. So I think many of you know that UPEI and Holland College are working on curriculum development around a certificate and a graduate program, and um, really in support of a lot of what the Clean Tech Initiative is. So I'd love to hear more about your thoughts about how that contributes, how you see that playing a role in the whole scheme of, of the transition, the energy transition for PEI. And uh, to Soren, I know that, that you've worked with universities across the globe on this, and the sort of the unique roles that universities and colleges have played that, that aren't sort of the, the normal rote you take classes and, and move on, sort of this more experiential piece of it. So, Minister? Sure, so I, I think for, for us, we're, we look at it like there's, there's problems in the, the world that nobody has solved. And, and uh, when, when we look at what we're trying to do, what the original idea was for the clean tech facility was to kind of let students and industry interact at some point through, through the process so that industry could put their ideas into the third and fourth year students who may opt to stay longer than the, than the master's program to work on solutions that, uh, that may be on their mind or that they know that they can do or that they, they think they can prove. And, and part of it is to pr provide the ability to, to test, you know, either through an on-site microgrid or, or some sort of a, a, an energy asset that could power the facility and the surrounding buildings itself so that you could really give a good test to some products that you may have. But it could be a, it could be energy, it could be storage, and it could be, you know, uh, a bearing that makes things run and produce more energy. Or I know Carl Brothers, who was there today, he he's refitting windmills down there in that that site right now, putting larger blades on them and able to get more energy out of a turbine because of it. So it's ingenuity that we're really we're looking for, and we're banking on the young generation to be able to come in and come up with uh, new and creative ways to solve the problems that haven't yet been solved yet and haven't even yet been identified yet because we're going to be going through this for ma many, many years. And use them to help Prince Edward Island with their transition, but also use them to share with uh, other jurisdictions. And one of the things that I learned about the energy file, really being new to it in 2019, was if you find somebody like yourself <laughs> who's a, who really cares about this, they will share anything with you. Like nobody's looking to cash a check from having a conversation with you, unlike many other industries that you may deal with on a daily basis where, where somebody wants to be paid to, to give you advice. And in, in the energy industry, I, it's really easy to find people that just want to freely share the things that they know, the experiences that they've had, and, and those types of things. So I think they, it all ties together really well. It's an industry of openness, and if we can get young people in there looking to solve tomorrow's problems, then we may fix a problem that, that is a problem worldwide, and I mean, um, it would be something that would be great for, for Prince Edward Island, but I think it's something that'd be great for the world if we were able to do that. Yeah, no, I completely agree. I, I work with a lot of people who, um, maybe they're in accounting or they're in tech in a different area, and they want to transition to energy. They realize this transition's happening, it's a super exciting time to be in energy, and they want to be part of it. And so, you know, uh, through this process, I've gotten to know the folks at Holland College, I'm super impressed. Um, with what goes on here, um, and of course, I, you know, UPI um, is near and dear to me now, but, but, but seeing the thoughtfulness about, hey, there's people who are out there doing X, Y, and Z, and they want to apply those skills to energy, and how can we help that transition and build the capacity, not just here on the island, but elsewhere, to be able to staff those jobs that are coming. And I mean, I know that you saw it on SAMHSA, is a big push for what you did 
was around the economics, around job creation. Mm. And, and certainly we see that happening across all the industries mm. around job creation, no? Sure. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's no, no, I mean, you can be a retired person and live from your retirement pension. But if you want to have a living there and, and being a young person, you need a job. You need an income. And, and, and this is, we need to create the conditions for people to create that, that kind of, of, of life. Uh, I see new generations actually kind of organize themselves differently. So, so they move from Copenhagen or from Aarhus to Samsø and they, they can live from one income. So one stays home or maybe work externally uh, remote, like uh, home office with an internet connection. We have super fast internet, which is one of the conditions also to, 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 to make people live there. Which, I mean, we have wired, we have uh, 100 megabit up and down uh, to every house on the entire island. And that's in the ground also. So, so that was an investment made to make sure that we could actually invite people to come there and they wouldn't say, no, it, it won't work, I need to be connected. So we are connected. So this is one connection. The other way is to educate the next generation in, in what we do here. So we have a, a very good relation with some of the universities also, where we, 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 we have organized ourselves as a field study area. We don't have a university on Samsø, but we're connected to Danish universities, and they send students to Samsø, and we will set up problems that they need to work with. So, so like field study areas. And this is realistic projects where they do mass calculations and planning structure also as part of their curriculum, which I think is really cool. And we use the numbers kind of without thinking about it. I mean, may, maybe they made mistakes, but you know, I already proved that we need to make, make mistakes to get somewhere. <laughs> but, but they will be the future inhabitants. And they'll come to some, some of them will get, I mean, sometimes, I mean, my father, when I was a young guy and, and, and I was living on the farm, he said, you have to marry someone from outside. I mean, which is to avoid the inbred families in the north. <laughs> so, so, so you have to bring some new blood to Samsung. And, and I think the same is for the next generation. It has to come from, from other, what do you call, professions and other, other ideas. So they bring something useful to the island. I think that's why the Vikings, they rode out and pillaged and raped and whatever they did. I mean, I don't know. I don't think they were as bad as the reputation. So they, they brought home the knowledge of how to produce wine and beer and make cement and lime and all kinds of things here, also, and which they didn't know beforehand. So we need this kind of constant connection to, to knowledge and, 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 and the research in science to, to be able to develop and, and thrive in that. I think that's very important for, for us to understand that we don't know everything. No, absolutely. Uh, what was interesting today at the, uh, at the workshop someone brought up we were asking, throw out some questions. You know, what, what do you want to talk about? What are we we're here to um, discuss? And someone had brought up, and it resonated with me, uh, how do we learn from past successes um, and inform the future, right? Sometimes it feels like someone comes and says, I have this great idea, and there's four people in the room that go, yeah, we did that like 10 years ago, or my grandfather did it, or, or whatever, this, this, this historical knowledge. And this is whether it's in, in farming or housing, the um, the example that comes to mind for me, because I work with utilities all across the globe, and some utilities are, are slower to move than others, and there's some that are really cutting edge, and, and I would say Summerside um, utility here on the island, I'd put it up there right with the top of the other utilities I've worked with that are, are leading edge, and, and with this small community, they have, they have proven out a whole bunch of stuff, right? <laughs> and they've made a lot of mistakes, which I think they'll freely admit, and they've, they've learned a lot, and that's something that, that could be scaled and could be applied. So this idea of learning, whether it's from recent projects or past generations, how do we bring that knowledge forward? And, and I know you have a lot of experience with that with your, with your father and with uh, other efforts you did on SAMHSA. Mm. I mean, we, we, we did, we did, I mean my, my, my upbringing was full of mistakes. <laughs> maybe, yeah. maybe I was one, I don't know, but... but uh... Not me. <laughs> No, no, my, my, my father's generation also did a lot of things here also because that was in the period where, where farming changed from traditional old circular economy farming where you had like five cows or ten cows, I mean, and some pigs and some, I mean, you had everything within the farm and you had like a very circular economy, you produced everything you could use and that when it kind of, when the change happened and we industrialized farming, that changed a lot when the tractors replaced the horses. 
That's when we start, stop cutting grass in the, in the lower areas and the, in the wetlands and stuff like that, and we start plowing it. That's, that's actually where we, all the trouble started, because this is when you then started emitting a lot of nitrogen to the, to the water levels and, and to the seas also, which is not so good. So the tractor was good for many things, but also bad for, for what you call it, the, the very circular economy. And, and to avoid that, we, we needed to do something about industry. And we, we, produced, we built the biggest pig farm in Denmark uh, on Samsø to save a, a, an arbitrary a slaughterhouse that we had that employed 100 people. And, and the main slaughterhouse association in Denmark, they wanted to close it down because it was inefficient, according to them. We didn't think it was because it served 100 families. They had their income from that. They had kids in the school and cars to be mended and stuff like that. So it meant a lot. But finally, they closed it anyway. But we kept it alive for 25 years. So I grew up with this. My farm was fighting for this uh, all the time. And it was a big mistake because that was not a nice farm, the, the, the big pig farm <laughs> with a lot of manure. But it was not because of the farm. It was because of, of the change. They couldn't accept the changes that was in the, in the inevitable. I mean, we, we couldn't fight it. So I think we, we, are, on, we are resting on, on an industrialization that hasn't really found its level yet. We're still developing it. So I think we need to be very detailed and very, very specific about where we want to get, where we want to go with it. This is where we need the next generation so it can help us not make so many mistakes <laughs> and do the right thing. So the communication is also good. I, mean, I just got a memo. I mean, I just got a memo like a little glimpse also. I mean, and I mean, is this a secret that you are kind of come from America? <laughs> oh, all right. Wait a minute, let me stay. Did I promise not to say it? I have to leave. Oh, sorry. <laughs> You escaped America somehow. I don't know. A refugee, yeah. <laughs> but, but before this, Anna was, uh, was uh, working with this College of the Atlantic in, in Maine. And, and I've been there a couple of times also. And, and Anna and her colleagues, they set up a program where they wanted to make an island development program. So they brought the students to SAMSI for three weeks, I think. Maybe more? Six. Six weeks? Six weeks. Wow. So the whole, the whole group there, like students and, and teachers, uh, professors were there. And then the, the whole project was that every student would be connected to an island. So at the last week, we had persons from Minel Haven, North Haven, Monhegan, Swan, Long Island, and all the islands. Good. Yeah. All of them I remember all these yeah. islands, all the down coast here. And they came to Samsø, and then they worked with the students to make a master plan for all, each of the, all these islands here. And I really liked that program because it, made, it meant a lot of patience from the people from the islands because the students were a little bit crazy and they had all kinds of ideas and they wanted to make a lot of change and, and graduate and have good grades in, 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 at, at the university. But they were patient because they knew that this was the next generation. So they guided them gently towards kind of some results here also and afterwards they kind of kept connecting to them. And I really liked that program but that was a hands-on program for people to get connected. And, and I mean, you can do a lot of science and, and other things here also. That was kind of in your face realism, uh, basically kind of a learning lesson for them I, that probably never forget. No, absolutely. It was, it was phenomenal. But I, and I think it really worked both ways. So the students learned really practical skills where, where they might want to do A, B, and C, but they're faced with an island community that, that just won't work, right? That, that just, that, so so the, re, the science hits the reality, right? What you're learning theoretically might not happen in this community, even though it worked on paper. And vice versa, the community members who maybe, you know, maybe are stuck in their ways. Maybe they've had the same dozen ideas circulating within this, in this community for so long to have these fresh ideas, look at it from a completely different perspective. And maybe that perspective these students were offering up aren't a direct fit, but it opens up that idea of, of thinking outside the box in, in some way, shape, or form. There's actually two, um, documentary videos on the perspectives, and you hear the, the, the guys from Vinyl Haven saying just that, that the, these fresh ideas. So I think it was a win-win. And I see that all the time at, at University of PEI, where in the engineering program, really, really across so much of the university, is about this experiential learning. And that, and that brings, it really brings the community to, to um, the academics and to that younger generation in a way here. Uh, I got to say, PEI is so fortunate. Like uh, Soren was saying, that, that he doesn't have a university on SAMSO. Where I was, where I came from, there was a very small, intentionally small, 400-person um, college university. But here, you, you have you have an incredible wealth of educational institutions and, and expertise here to draw on, um, and then students coming from all over the world, which I imagine again informs 
how you go forward. Yeah, I think, I don't know if I'm still on there, we go. I, I'm, I think that our, t the two main institutions here have done a really good job the last little while attracting students to come from different places in the world. And I mean, obviously it brings a lot of perspective and a lot of them stay, which is, which is great for the fabric of Princeton Rhode Island. And I think that, you know, when, when we start looking at our current problems through the, the lens of, of somebody who didn't grow up with all the, uh, um, what's the, how's the nice way to say it, but the, the not, not been encumbered by the naysayers of, of the community, they, they're able to look at things really from a practical point of view and, and you know, not look at the barriers. They're, they're able to look at, at solutions. So I, I think that part is, is really exciting. I think that, that the change that we've seen over the past 10 years or so has been really exciting for Prince Edward Island. And we're finding now, as we kind of root around for people to help us out, we're finding all these people that are, are highly educated, really smart, are, come from unique backgrounds and unique places that can help us with our current day problems. So I think that's a really important part where we probably didn't have that when I was growing up. I mean, you know, I don't know if I didn't know anybody who spoke a different language or was a different color. Like that's just the way we were back, back then. We were very, you know, white Protestant or Catholic. That was it. It's, and now you're even letting Americans in, so we, we appreciate that. But they probably didn't know. <laughs> you didn't know when I got here. I know, I know. It was an accident. <laughs> I believe that. So, so when you think about this transition, what do you see as, as I mean, there's obviously all these positives, but, but really what has been the biggest challenge or, or challenges that you, as, as you took on this, this effort? There's been quite a few of them. I think the, at the start, we were really still in the, that start stage where we're trying to lift the balloon up off the ground. So we're trying to get some, some wind in it and we're trying to... Um, you know, get our message penetrated to the point that Islanders understand that we're, what, that we're doing this and what it actually means. We have a, a really good team with Angela and, and Derek and they've, they've hired staff to, to fill out different parts of it. So we're, we're starting to grow and we're really starting to take action on, on the files. We've done a lot of things that are, you know, that are, I guess, to be the bling of, of our climate change effort, like solar panels and EV rebates, things that people can physically see that may not be the, the, the most important things that we need to do to reduce our, our GHGs, but it's the, the setting the mindset to people that this, is, that this means change and that the change is coming and that change isn't necessarily bad. So that's the, the first part. It was really hard to get the buy-in to do it to begin with because um, the original committee that we had to, to strike out on our net zero effort didn't uh, want to do it as quick as I want to do it. And they, they wanted to wait and see what other jurisdictions were going to do, which I didn't want to do because I knew that somebody had to be the first jurisdiction. And quite often in Prince Island, we wait for Ontario to do it. And if you follow climate change at all, if we're waiting for Ontario, we're probably going to wait. So I, I think that it was important for, for it was important to me that that we were leaders. So I feel like for a long time I was I was swimming upstream, but I, when I look out here now, I. I clearly wasn't. There was people that were there, and I just didn't know know they were. So I, I think it's fantastic that we were able to grow this to the point where people are actually interested in it. And I think that that right there has the wind and the sails that we need to bring it across the line. I mean, it, it certainly impacts everyone, right? And and, and whether you you're interested because uh, or motivated because of economics, because we see the cost of solar panels going down, um, or the ability to to buy a battery or an EV or because it's around energy resiliency. How many of us didn't have power for how long and, and how do we take, take hold or ownership of our own energy future? Or, or maybe it's driven by, by um, you know, concern for the environment and climate change, but it, it's definitely a unifying, you know, once the, the wheels start going, it really can be unifying regardless of what motivation um, you're coming from. And I mean, I know you, you talk about this a lot on SAMHSA is that it's, you know, people might come to the table for different reasons, and you know, maybe the person who's, how, how do you say, the, the non-PC hippie, the, the, <laughs> the activist, yeah. versus you know, the local farmer who's, who's really yeah. interested in their business. Um, one of the things that I dealt with a lot in the city was um, because of so many power outages, uh, business is losing money you mm. know, because they couldn't do business. Mm. Restaurants couldn't do business. And I, I gotta think that that was a big driver uh, or something that you deal with a lot in other communities you work with. 
there's many different reasons for people to be active in the in this process. And I mean, the, the, whatever we do is always kind of rounded of the problems or the, the what called the, the the barriers you, you have locally. So SAMS is one, PEI is, is another kind of condition that you have to work with. I think the, the, the basic instrument for change is that you can see the opportunity of change in, in, in your own midst and, and, and see what's in it for me. We, we talk a lot about, I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a general say that there's a NIMBY effect. Do you know the NIMBY? So they're not in my backyard effect. I think it's created by journalists and, 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 and pre the press because that's a good argument to have like a, a conflict where they can write a lot of stories about the conflict. The NIMBY is, is, is people's reaction to something they don't like. Not in my backyard. But I think that is, I mean, some, some say we should change, change the NIMBY to YIMBY, yes, in my backyard. But no, I don't want to take that kind of argument because it's not about my backyard. It's what's in it for me. So, so the whole argument is to turn it around and say, so now how can we showcase to people that there's something in it for them that is benefiting their wishes for the good life and for the, for the livelihood and for the climate and for all the things here. So the what's in it for me element is exactly us checking the, the conditions about possibilities. And I think I'm, I'm, I'm an optimist, sometimes not, not, not all the time. Generally, I'm an optimist because I think that we will do our utmost to kind of see what the what's in it for me element. We fail a lot and we do a lot of mistakes all the time. And, and the climate is in trouble. And, and, and I'm not sure we know what to do about it. But we have to do the best we can here. And that I think the driver that it is driving fastest is the what's in it for me element. So if from top down, the government and the province and, and the local community actually paves the way and make conditions for people to act in the right way, then people will do it if they can see the benefit of it. But, but on the other hand, you also have this bottom-up approach where people will organize locally in kind of a, a neighbor effect thing here also. When you see people acting, then you also see people responding to the neighbor. Oh, the neighbor's got solar panels on his roof, and he's also driving an electric car, and I've heard he has a battery also in his house now. So, I mean, he's showing off this guy. But on the other hand, it's also attractive to do and to replicate and get some inspiration from people who are doing things here also. So there's kind of a, a, like a snowball effect in this also that when you get the ball rolling, which is done by politics and, and in, in, what do you call it, in, uh, institutions, institutions and, and funding and stuff like that, but the real action happens when people take it on and, and start moving on it. And I think this is where, where the communication has to, is vital. You have, to, you have to communicate that in the right way. The problem is that very often, if it's a good deal, then business will run away with it, and you become customers in their shop. I mean, do you know the feeling? I think that is some, I mean, we need both. It's both industry and business, but it's also engagement and activity and participation in the process. And that's a fine, delicate balance that we have to operate here. No, it definitely is. And it's funny you say that, that we see our neighbors have solar panels or have batteries. And, and that's attractive to us. Mm. And as island communities, we see another island who has done this through a really unique way of this, this public participation. And you know, it's inspiring the islands I've lived on and, and worked on, obviously, PEI. In, in how did you do that? And maybe that's interesting to us mm. to do that. And the uh, story, it reminds me of, you, you mentioned when we brought the islanders. So, so this project, as you can imagine, bringing all these different islanders from different islands in Maine over to Samso, planning the projects, you know, thinking through what, what projects they should be. It was a lot of work, right? I mean, and uh, we get over there, and Soren's, uh, the guy who works for Soren's guy, Jesper, takes a few of the guys, and they go golfing. And, like, they were lost. Like, that was it. Because, because all these projects they had planned um, paled in comparison to what Samso did with their golf course, making a completely sustainable golf course. And... What's that? The golf course is a good story. The golf course is, is a great story. In fact, I, um, I came here thinking that everybody here was into hockey, and I learned that you're all into golf as well. Um, my, my neighbor, uh, Edith, is a, a wonderful golfer and all over the island with golf courses. But what you guys did, I mean, I know it's a small part of the overall what you did, but it's an yeah. interesting anecdote of, of finding these attractive projects that people can get around. You want to talk a little bit about it? Yeah. Do you have many golf courses here? Yeah, quite a few. So golf is a big thing here. So we didn't usually have golf. I mean, we considered golf as kind of a, a little bit posh sport. I mean, so we didn't like it until we had a golf course. <laughs> and everybody's playing golf now. I, I don't. 
because I still play soccer. I, I believe I'm 20 something odd years. And I like kind of tackling some of the, my, my friends there. So that's the only way I can really get, get, get them down on the, on the ground. But, and you don't do that in golf yet. I mean, <laughs> you don't tackle so much. <laughs> <clears throat> but the golf course was, I mean, we established golf course in a very beautiful hilly area, and it's an old farm, uh, land, farmland area that was bought for this farm. It's an 18-hole golf course, and it, 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 it has the, what do you call it, the size and scale for Pro-Am tours, so, so we have a Pro-Am, European Pro-Am uh, tournament uh, on this golf course. Just to say it's high standard, it's a really good golf course. But we realized we used a lot of fertilizer, we used a lot of chemicals to make it run, um, this golf course, and, and we felt bad about it because, I mean, it's a lot of hectares that's just lying out there, and just for people to walk around with a little silly ball and some clubs and, and, and just use a lot of chemicals to, to make that happen. So the, the greenkeeper, who is a local guy, he saw that in Scotland you could buy seaweed fertilizer. So he bought kind of the first bottles of seaweed fertilizer and tested it on, on, on the greens, and it actually seemed to work good. So they started producing this seaweed fertilizer, which is made of kelp and some, something else, there's a lot of minerals in it. And then they, they realized that we, we need to have a nitrogen fixator because the greens has to be very green and very sturdy and tough, so you can roll the ball and there's a lot of traffic on it. So they planted a micro clover, which is nitrogen collecting roots, the, 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 I don't know what you call that. There's a, sign, there's a biological term for, for, the, for the system because ni clovers are, are, what do you call it? Uh, they, they, they keep nitrogen, and they will share it with grass. So it's a combination of grass and clover. So we, they, they, there's no, no nitrogen introduced, no fertilizer to this golf course at all. So no chemical, no fertilizer, and all the lawnmowers are electric and solar powered, uh, also for the greens. And we use sheep for, sheep for, the, for the rough. So in the nighttime, the, the, the greenkeepers, they shift the sheep from one side to the other. Uh, <laughs> Because, and they have to ch ch chase them a little bit around in the rough before because then they, they put all the pellets out before they cross the, the green because otherwise there's a lot of work in, in doing it. Do you think he's kidding? This is true. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> and the members of the golf course, they have shares in the sheep, so when they butcher some of the lambs, they, they get their lamb leg and stuff like that. So everybody accepts this as, as a fact. But the fun thing is that it's, it's sponsored by a big pump company in Denmark called Grundfos. So, so, so I challenged them a little bit. So all the water irrigation is from a low-lying pond with solar panels and one of these pumps that lift 25 meters by 20 watts or something. It's, it's crazy how efficient these pumps are. So they constantly pump water up in the upper reservoir on the top of the hill. There's three ponds there. And via gravity, they irrigate all the greens uh, with the system here. And every, all the water that is not used, it will run back to the low-laying pond and then be recircled again and pumped back in the system. So we don't use any imported electricity either. So it's a greenest golf course. So we actually excuse people who come in the big four-wheel drive uh, and park the, <laughs> the diesel engine in front, in front of the golf course and then play very sustainable golf. <laughs> so next time we need them to hire at least one of the electric cars to get them. But it's just to say that it's possible to do that. And that's branding the island also. And because we have big signs saying that this is the greenest, that we won the Danish Golf Association's Environmental Award two years in a row because we did that. And, and I think that's part of the narrative also, that we are, we're not just talking about it, we're doing what we say. I think that's important also for the message here also. Mm. They always clap for you. They always clap for you. That's <laughs> yeah, because I talk too much, so they want to clap until so I keep quiet. <laughs> Um, we are getting close to time, so um, do you have any closing words before we sign off to Soren here? Yeah, I guess, I mean, for, for us, we know we have a lot of challenges yet, so we're, we, we're going down, down this path and we, we want to decarbonize, but we also want to transition our, our energy source. We also know that without changing any of our habits as we electrify, we're going to double our, our grid load, so we know that's going to create a lot, a lot of challenges. And, <laughs> Most people, I don't know how many people in this room besides myself and Tyson and Brad were, were gripped to the, to the gauge on our, on our uh, website um, looking at our energy load during our cold snap on the weekend, but there was, it was quite scary at times. We, we had 22% uh, higher than our, our all-time high load during that period, so that's a lot of energy that we 
that obviously Maritime Electric had to come up with in order to power our system and keep the power on for everybody. And those loads will continue to increase unless we obviously make some changes on how we, we use energy and, and the time of day and those types of things. But it's also brought up a lot of concerns about our own energy security. So we're very concerned internally about how do we make sure that the energy is always going to be there and it comes back to the community level generation. So if we can get Islanders to buy into community ge um, generation and we can provide some storage either in home or, or uh, large scale storage that we can store power in, we'll become a lot closer to be able to, to claim our independence so that we don't have to worry about the, where our power comes from. We know where it comes from. It's here and it's stored here and it's, it's generated here. So the, uh, I think it was a big, big eye opener and we knew the grid was going to grow and we knew that our, our uh, capacity was going to have to grow with it. But uh, I, think that, I think that everybody was quite surprised with how quick it shot up to that, yeah. that load. So there's a lot of concerns that we have and as we make our transition, I think it's more important now than ever that we engage communities and we build a community um, energy system, which is something that we've been actively working on for the last couple of years. And it's, it's a very complicated process to get uh, across the line, but we want to get it right. And I know that, you know, Soren's group has done a lot of work in this field. So we're really looking to, for, for um, best practices from SAMSO and how we can do it, implement it properly and provide our own independence from energy. So. Yeah, it's not even a matter of, of, of if anymore. It's, it's here, right? The when is here, and now it's just how do we navigate this together and, and um, get to the other side? Because there's no going back now, right? And, and so how do we, how do we get there? Um, and again, it's just an exciting time to be here. For me, it was just so great to be part of uh, that community conversation today and seeing so many people so passionate about figuring out how to get there. And the discussion I heard today was, was really heartening, especially not being from here and having that context to see that, that sort of connection today was, was great. Um, but Soren, you know, obviously we love seeing you. So glad you came. Um, do you have any parting comments or uh, words of wisdom for, for all of us here? Words of wisdom? Hmm. Careful. <laughs> well, I, 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 I quoted uh, a philosopher from Denmark uh, this morning, uh, Søren, Søren Kierkegaard, who, who was a philosopher uh, that I like to quote. He's, he's a very cunning, very, very funny man also, but he says, we, we live the life forward, but we understand it backwards or in hindsight. I mean, so, 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 so sometimes we need to remember that we, we, there's a lot of experience that we need to build on. We cannot just live forward all the time and, and, and be in the, in, in the making or in the future. So we have to kind of sometimes, under, I mean, the way to understand things is, is to remember where we come from. Uh, and I, I think this is something that I, I keep reminding myself that I, I, I always kind of think about where we come from. Uh, just as, as, a, as a memo here for myself, I'm going to Ottawa tomorrow um, to speak at the FCM, like the Federation of Canadian Municipalities. I'm, I'm doing the keynote opening on, I'm the, on the 8th, which is a great honor. Also, there's going to be four or 500 people there um, at this also municipality from all over Canada. And I'm also connected to the First Nation program called ICE, Indigenous Clean Energy Act, which is ha operating all over Canada. And I also met some of the First Nations here and they, they know about this program. So it's kind of family, which I, I, I do like. It's, it's an island family I have here now, so thank you for treating me well. That's nice. But it's also a continuous de evolution and development of new connections in this. And just to say that SAMHSA is not just kind of the example. We are just one well-known place. We just signed a contract with Japan, so we're going to operate 100 communities in Japan that is decided by the Japanese government to be carbon neutral by 2040, I think it is. So, so these 100 carbon neutral communities is going to be operated from a top-down decision from the, from the Japanese government, but it's rural communities like this, this Ogatamura, which is an island in the middle of the lake. It's a rice community with rice farmers, so they don't have potatoes, but they have rice. They produce a very good sake and they're very proud of it. It's probably the best sake in the world, and the rice is also the, probably the best rice in the world. So they, they're very similar to us. <laughs> <laughs> and they're looking into a new paradigm because they used to be fed by nuclear power and centralized energy systems, and they want to be independent now. So what you learn here, 
it's going to be valuable in the future to exchange with other communities also. So I think kind of I appreciate this connection because it, it brings more. And there's lots of work to do here also. I mean, you're looking at electric school buses. You're looking at all kinds of things here. And we need to study what is happening in, in, in that de development because this is something we can use in a, in a condensed, like, like soup, uh, what do you call it, uh, <laughs> a concentration of many good things has to be kind of the export of, of the future. So new students will come and study what you're doing here. I, I like this. I don't know what you do, but I like it. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Good seeing you all.